Um. Oh, that's me. I'm going to hand over to Michelle. Thanks. So, of course, this is Ivan. Some of you uh, might have heard him on the radio and ask any questions on Radio 4 the other week where he challenged Ruth Davidson. He said, don't challenge me in the numbers, Ruth. And uh, I think that was a fair statement. Uh, have you got the zappy thing? I'll need that. Okay, so Business for Scotland's laboured quite heavily on the facts, the economic case. And if you look in our website, www.businessforscotland.co.uk, you'll see a lot of the key facts summarised in there, a lot of very interesting articles from a wide variety of contributors. But of course, hearts and minds need to be included when you're, we're making such a big decision. And I thought it'd be worthwhile just putting in a section around change, confidence, and ambition. That's Edward Munch, the scream in there. So sometimes you might feel like that when you're not quite clear about how you should make a decision. Change. So this is the sort of thing I used to hear about it all the time when I was working in corporate life. And uh, I was subject to lots of business of change. I was uh, threatened with redundancy a number of times. I was made redundant and so on. And I would often hear this kind of language, oh, well, change is necessary. And, and, you know, as you go through your career, you react in a number of different ways. Sometimes you think, oh, I wish it was. And it can be difficult and it can be a scary place, particularly where change is being foisted on you, where you have no control over the change. That is the hardest thing and it can be very difficult to come to terms with. However, we do have choices here about affecting our own future and creating our own change by putting ourselves in the driving seat. So if you ever hear that voice in your head that says, oh, this is happening now and I don't like this, challenge yourself. Well, how is that change being foisted upon you? And ask yourself the question, wouldn't it be better if we were in the driving seat? And we, at a national level, have had some significant changes over the past few years, many of them very, very uncomfortable for a lot of us. So I'm, making it, I'm saying your life doesn't get better by chance, it gets better by change. You need to stand up and be counted, if you like. Confidence. This is the other thing, because we go out and about and we talk to a lot of people, and you often get this kind of, yeah, but. So they listen to Ivan talking and they go, yeah, uh -huh, I get that. So actually, Scotland is wealthier. Yes, Scotland has all these natural resources, but, and particularly of a certain age, when you've been brought up to believe throughout your entire life that something is true, even although the facts are presented to you that it's, it's absolutely fundamentally not true, it can sometimes be difficult to get your head around. So in terms of making changes, confidence to me, but both at individual level and at national level is a choice you make. You need to stand up and say, no, I'm going to choose this. You need to take off the hat possibly that you've worn for years and years if you read all the, some of the newspaper press. And some of it we're still getting today. Ah, oh, well, aye, but I mean, that needs to change as well. So the kind of thing I would say is just about challenging your, your core assumptions and almost like taking a step back and saying, okay, so somebody wants me to believe that is true. Alistair Darling wants you to believe some stuff is true and you need to ask your question, in whose vested interests is it that that were true? And just ask yourself that question. So as, as Ivan made the point earlier, well, of course Alistair Darling is going to say that because guess what, you know what? He's going to be out of a job, and he doesn't want that to happen. So just challenge yourself a wee bit. Ambition. Ambition is a word that people, for some reason, have become quite uncomfortable with. It's perceived, uh, and particularly I'd say quite a lot for women, it's perceived as something, oh, well, we don't, we don't quite like that. But actually, if you look at Scotland, Scotland's been fiercely ambitious throughout its history, of which the past 300 years is only a tiny part. In terms of you look at what Scotland's given to the world in a whole range of sectors, that ambition to grow, develop and learn and help and support other people in the world has been very much a feature. And so all the words associated there with goals, aims, objective, purpose, desire, wish, design, these are fantastic things. And maybe we've lost sight of how important that is. And particularly as well, I would say, our young people. I've got a 19-year-old son. 
And when he's not so much so bad now, but you know, maybe a couple of years ago, I'd asked him about something, and of course, I got the typical, oh. "Well, what are you going to do? What do you think about that?" Oh. And actually, it's fundamentally unhealthy. What that's saying is a message that, "Well, I don't know. Is there anything out there for me?" Some of that's the uncertainty of youth, but some of it is maybe I would suggest losing sight of how important it is to say no. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to change the world. And if you listen to how some young people in other countries talk, we are different. And I think that's something that needs to change. This is quite an interesting little graph about the use of the word ambition in English-speaking dictionaries. And it kind of made me laugh how ambition was used all the time and it's gradually been tailed away. And of course, if you look at the dates around that, that's quite interesting as well. What has been the set of circumstances where the use of the word ambition has been tailing away? I wonder why that might be. Okay, so ambition for myself. Uh, when I was uh, growing up, my father's greatest ambition for me was to be a trainee clerk S in the electricity board here in Glasgow. And uh, my father, wonderful man, can't speak highly of him enough, but that in some respects was the, was the scope of his ambition for me at that time, to get me into a secure job, something that he perceived was safe. And I remember being really quite offended by that because I felt myself felt much, much more ambitious. I wanted to go and do other things and grow and develop and learn. And again, going back to my point earlier, we have some received wisdom about what is acceptable sometimes for our young people, which does come from our parents. And we need to say, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm not doing that. And I know with my father, sorry, Dad, if you watch this, but we had a wee fallout uh, about that for, for some years. Women as well, it, it's become, again, received wisdom that women should not be ambitious. There's a slight kind of, hmm, oh, I, I, we don't know if we quite like that. When in reality, I think women are ambitious and it's important that we have that in our society because women will bring a lot of extra characteristics into business as well and we've kind of lost sight of that and this use of the kind of word ambition i'm very ambitious for business for scotland because i think it's a very useful niche to have the fact that we are apolitical we've got some people involved in politics some people have no politics at all it's about standing up and being counted and and talking about the business and economic arguments an interesting thing about the rest of the UK, I have no truck with people making comments about our friends, cousins, families across the border. It is not about that. It's about us standing up and taking accountability for ourselves. And by doing so, I genuinely believe that that will trigger change in the rest of the UK. The Westminster political system is bust. It's bust because it favours large sections of the community and disfavours others. And we see the results and the evidence of that in many areas of England and Ireland and Wales as well. So I believe by Scotland becoming independent and taking control of its own fiscal levers, it must trigger change in Westminster itself as well, because frankly, they've had things too easy for too long. And when you have a House of Lords that is bigger than both the houses in the United States and is bigger than the European Union, and they're unelected, I'm sorry, but there's something seriously wrong at the heart of your political system. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, a bit of politically there, actually. Vision. And again, this is something, I brought along a wee uh, book for you tonight. I'll just show you the size of it. Now, today, I was interested in the launch of the white paper, which I will talk a wee bit about. But Alistair Carmichael was tweeting at half past eight this morning saying, before the white paper came out at 10 o'clock, oh, it's a lot of rubbish. Now, <laughs> this, if you look at the size of this and look at the weight of it, that is only one section of the white paper. And I'm happy to show anyone who's interested, but each individual assertion in there is costed and backed up by graphs. And I know John Swinney particularly is very, very cautious about the numbers. So I'm not prepared to let anyone say, oh, it's lightweight, it's flimsy. It is setting out a grand vision 
for what Scotland can be. And how exciting is that? So, for example, what's the tax system going to be? That. It's a blank sheet of paper. We can start off running with what is in place just now and change it to suit ourselves. So in terms of vision, it is the biggest single opportunity that Scotland has had for many, many years to shape things and make a difference both for ourselves and our children and our children's children. So some examples of my vision. And again, I make no apologies for this. This idea that, well, it'd be nice if... How about, well, the Constitution? We don't have within the UK a written Constitution. Wouldn't it be wonderful, isn't it going to be wonderful that we have a written Constitution that enshrines the rights, the sovereign rights of people in Scotland? Wouldn't that be fantastic that sets out our stall about being a forward-looking, modern democracy where people uh, have rights? And that's a very important principle for Scotland. Our democracy, when we factor our votes into how much they count for in Westminster, it's 1 in 11. Wouldn't it be fantastic if our vote counted every single time? And it's as though you know, this is a democratic principle. And when I say things like that, I feel like jumping up and down the spot and saying, this is fundamentally what's, uh, what it's about. Child poverty. How did it happen? The areas of Scotland, and particularly in Glasgow, have equivalent child poverty to third world countries when Ivan has so clearly explained that the wealth we hold as a country. How did that happen? And how can that be allowed to continue to happen? It's an absolute disgrace, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Education. <laughs> yeah. Education. It's a fundamental, and it's, it's that that has set Scotland apart. Our belief that everybody deserves the right to an excellent education to further themselves, to drive themselves forward. We don't want to lose sight of that, and it's a fundamental principle as well. For business, I sort of said a wee bit at the, the beginning, but business is not, to me, about global large companies raping uh, our society and moving on somewhere else. Business in Scottish terms is about our local businesses, what they bring to our community, the jobs they provide for people. And I remember growing up how predominant business was, you know, when I went to the Highland Games and all that kind of thing, and all the local businesses were represented. And for some reason, we've allowed ourselves to think, oh, no, that's not business. That is what we're about. And if you look again at the opportunity about how other countries run their business, the, the concept of you only have a shareholder model. No, again, we've got an opportunity to change that. Look at what happens in other countries. How Look at uh, for Germany, for example, in terms of their Mittelstag, where people have a share, they have a stake in their local business. We have the chance to develop much more so social enterprises to look differently at business and make it have its rightful place in our community. And again, I think the UK PLC has lost sight of that. I thought it was worthwhile just giving a few points today and note that today the Scottish Government's white paper came out. Now, it's massive, over 170,000 words and over 670 pages, so I haven't read it yet. That's tonight on the, uh, on the way home. But there's some principles that it sets here. It sets out the conditions for a wealthier a wealthier and fairer society, and fundamentally the removal of things such as universal credit and the bedroom tax. Affordability and economic policies, they are really, really clearly costed, and also making the point that we can boost productivity by using these extensive additional financial levers. And again, a sort of favourite of mine in here is that you might hear in the press sometimes that people say, well, what's the point? If you're going to have a central bank and you're going to allow your interest rates to be set by the Bank of England, what's the point? Here's a list of additional fiscal levers that tell you exactly what the point is. So in other words, these are a list of things that we get additional tax take or would do if we were independent. Okay, here we go. So VAT, national insurance contributions, our geographical share of oil and gas revenue, corporation tax, fuel duties, Inheritance tax, tobacco duties, interest and dividends, 
alcohol duties, vehicle excise duty, capital gains tax, inheritance tax, insurance premier tax, air passenger duty, betting and gaming duties, climate change levy, aggregates levy, the crown estate, issuing government bonds, the ability to co-regulate banks and lenders. Tell me we couldn't do an awful lot with those additional fiscal levers. I'd also like to make clear that sometimes people talk about, oh, well, you know, maybe we should go for Devo Max. So the Scotland Act, of which the powers have not yet been fully introduced, would increase the percentage of tax take from 7% up to about 15%. You know, so it's, it's not setting the heather on fire. And let's be clear about this. So Scotland, even with the full powers given by the Scotland Act, still would only have control of 85% of its fiscal levers. So in other words, all the rest of that is being controlled by London and Westminster. So we should be very clear about that as well, the breadth of what we have on offer. So just carrying on with the, the white paper... Again, the, the details emerging about that, but there's some costed policies, particularly for families and childcare and pensions as well. And to me, there are the specifics around the policies, but it's also making the point that we need to do more to support our young people, our young families, where they want to work, they want to develop themselves, they want to get a better life for their children, and so far it's incredibly difficult. So there's a lot of detail to emerge out of that. Okay, right, so currency. Uh, I was surprised today that there were no proper challenges on the, the no campaign regarding currency. There will be a currency union, and there's some very simple reasons for that. Scotland and England do massive trade, and the question I've put here is, which UK challenge chancellor is going to break the news to the market that he's saying, no, 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 we no longer want the 400 million per month that comes from trading with Scotland, and we're quite happy to lose the 700,000 jobs. Of course he's not going to say that. That is politicking. And there's some very, very sound reasons for a currency union at this point in time. And of course, independence gives us the choice. If we wanted to change at some point, we can. But as an interim measure, it's absolutely the right thing to do. OK, and of course, we'll still get Doctor Who and relevant Scottish news output. OK, and the last week question I'll leave you to think about before we finish up. That big document I showed you, what is the no campaign offering? I ask this question every single time I go to one of these events and I just say, excuse me, could you just mind articulating a positive vision for the UK going forward? And guess what? I can't find anybody yet who's able to do that. I can hear them telling me, ah, but, ah, but it'll be this. Oh, that's a ridiculous idea. No, I want a positive vision of the future that makes me go, yes, that's fantastic. What have we got? UK, OK? Well, zoop de doop <laughs> We've also got real significant uncertainty, particularly in business terms, about will we be a part of the EU? The EU is very, very important. No, we've no certainty over that. Of course, increasing rumblings, particularly in the past couple of weeks and from our own uh, Alistair Carmichael about the Barnet formula. Pensions, no vision. You need to think about that and you need to understand that. Thank you.